Well, good morning. It's good to be here with all of you um, today. Uh, we, we have a tradition in the Moore family. Um, every year on New Year's Day, my family gathers together in my grandma and grandpa's living room and dining room and really anywhere where we can sort of stuff people for a meal. Um, we, about 40 some years ago, right around the time I was born, my grandma started the tradition of having fondue on New Year's Day. I don't know if you've ever done fondue. This isn't like chocolate fondue, like for the week where you just eat a little dessert. This is like you cook your whole meal in a burning pot of oil kind of fondue, right? In fact, I've got a picture. This is from 2015. This is just one table of a few tables that is just filled with cousins and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and grandparents and, and ne nieces and nephews and people gathered together to eat fondue together. In fact, that one fondue pot at the very bottom of the picture, the olive green one, like that's the one that started it all. Like that one is from 1972 and, and it's been there through all the years. And, and part of what I love about this meal, part of what I, what I love about this time together is one is, is it's designed to be slow. Um, you're cooking each little individual morsel of food and, and then you eat it and then you cook another one. And so when done properly, it takes an hour or an hour and a half. And, and, and we're all there decked out in our Ohio State gear and watching the games together and hanging out. And I, I love that about it. But I also love the, the fact that this meal has come to represent for me and my family so much more than that. It, it, it's a place where I am perhaps more than any other place completely known and yet fully loved by the people around me, right? That's hard to do, to know somebody that well and yet love them in spite of that, right? It's a place where the, the, the bonds that connect us together are so much stronger than anything about us that divides us, and we live all over the United States now. It's a place where I can look down the table and I can see this legacy of love and support and, and family and faith that has been so formative in my life. It's, it's from my 93-year-old grandfather to my six-month-old cousin's little baby girl all seated around the table. It's a place where I can feel the responsibility that, that what I've been given from the generations that came before me, that I have the responsibility to pass that on to the generations that come behind. You see, it's not about the meal. It, it's, it's about what it represents. It's about the people that surround me in that moment that are sharing it with me. It's, it's more than a meal. There's a, there's a greater purpose that informs it. See, today we're continuing in our series entitled Disciplines of Grace that we've been looking at over this summer. These, these intentional practices that we see taking place throughout the pages of the Bible that serve to help orient our lives around the foundational truth and experience as followers of Jesus of being transformed by grace. So there's these patterns that we can begin to integrate into the way that we do life that that remind us of grace that that allow us to experience it again and that help us demonstrate that same grace to the people around us in the course of our everyday lives and today we're going to talk about the practice the spiritual discipline of eating and gathering as a means of experiencing grace now i was just over at the kesslinger campus and i was delivering this there and right before I went up I heard somebody behind me look at the bulletin and go oh eating and gathering finally an easy one right <laughs> like I love to eat I've got this one down right but but as a reminder it's not it's not merely just the practice it's not merely just eating right it's it's the purpose and the heart posture that informs what's happening in that time in that place it's, it's about who we're eating with, and it's about what's taking place around the table in that space at that time. So this is, this is not about entertaining, although it can look similar at times. 
But the, the spiritual discipline of eating, eating and gathering has, has a far different objective in mind. When, when Jesus is teaching his followers about the kingdom of God, he, as he so often does, he tells them a story. And he says, uh, uh, the kingdom of God is, is a lot like this. Imagine a king, and you can find this in Matthew chapter 22 and, and Luke chapter 14. He says, imagine a king that's, that's throwing a party for his son's wedding. And he sends out his servants into the community around him. And he says, hey, you're invited. You are a part of this. Come be a part of this celebration. Come sit at my banquet table. And, he, and the invitation goes out to all the people that you might expect. All the people in that society and culture who have position and, and a place and honor. And, and some of them respond to the invitation by saying, you know what? I'm really busy right now. I've got a lot going on. I just bought some land or my own son is getting married or I've got these other things. I, I can't make it. But the king is undeterred. He, he says to his servants, keep, keep going. Keep going out in, into the alleys, into the back ways, into the, into the poor, into the lame, into the blind, into the sick, and, and, and bring them in. Invite them as well. I want them to be around my table. And as Jesus is telling the story, and, and, and Matthew, he, he says, it's, it's extend the invitation to the good and to the bad. That's an interesting way of saying it. Because then he says, this is what it's like in the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. I want to begin as we think about this practice of spiritual discipline by, by rooting it in Jesus' kingdom vision and with an understanding of the grand invitation. The grand invitation. That's a phrase that I'm borrowing from um, James Bryan Smith in his book, The Good and the Beautiful Life, which is an excellent resource on the practice of, of some of these spiritual disciplines that we've been talking about. See, but all of these disciplines, this one as well, it begins with an experience of grace that then produces expressions of grace. And this is where we have to start. When I was in uh, growing up, my, my older brother, and I've talked about this before, is four years older than me. So I was always sort of in that position of wanting to do the things that he did, but always sort of being too young. And also just too annoying, right, for him. So when he would have his friends over and, and, and that sort of thing, I always wanted to be a part of what was happening. These guys were like, this was, these were the cool kids, right? Like, as a middle school kid watching these high school kids, can I, can, I, can I play football with you guys? Can I hang out in your room when you guys are hanging out? But it was more often than not met with a shut door, right? This, this isn't for you. You don't. You don't belong here. This is, you're not a part of this, right? And then I got to do that to my little brother, and he got to do that to no one because he was the last one. That's, that's kind of how we operate. I was just flying back last Sunday at this time. I was coming back from our student trip to Ecuador. It was a fantastic time, but I'm, you're in coach, right? And you're looking forward on the plane, and you just see all this, like, magical things happening up there in first class. <laughs> Like, just people being fanned and, like, their seats laid back in the complete beds. And, like, it's just, like, and you're scrunched on, like, sleeping on some stranger's shoulder. And, and you're looking in there and you're saying, like, oh, man, I, that's, I'm left out of that. That doesn't, that's not for me what's happening up there. We know that feeling. We, we experience that in life all the time. See, this is, this is how people, when Jesus enters the scene, this is how they thought about the kingdom of God. Now, keep that in mind as we turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus' introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. This is his greatest exposition on what life and his kingdom is about and what it looks like and how to experience it. And this is how he begins. This is verse 1. He says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. And his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, 
falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, now oftentimes we, we read these words in the Beatitudes as it's, it's commonly referred to and we think of them as a set of attributes that I, I need to apply to my life, like a, a prescription for blessing. And so we try to integrate these things into our life, which in some ways is, is, is odd, right? Because the things that Jesus highlights here are, are not typically things that we would naturally pursue. But I don't think that's what Jesus is doing here. I don't think he's giving us prescriptions for blessing. I, I think Jesus is totally upending their understanding of who was invited into the kingdom. See, the, the predominant narrative in, in first century Judaism, the way people thought about God's kingdom and what he was going to usher in and who was going to be a part of it was this narrow select group of people who had the right qualifications, who met the right standards to get an invitation. So by definition, you had to be Jewish. So anybody that was, was a Gentile, anybody that was outside of Judaism, they're out. You also had to be male. Uh, to, to be female was considered to be a second-class citizen, and so by definition, you are out. You, you had to be physically, mentally whole and healthy. You, you, so anybody that was sick or, or dealing with disease, they were seen as being outside of God's blessing. There's something that they did, that the reason they're suffering in this way, so they're out. You also um, had to be spiritually, you had to... Um, um, hit all the marks. So anybody that culturally was viewed as a sinner, they're out. And you had to be wealthy. You, you had to have the, the mark of somebody who had God's blessing in your life. And so the kingdom of God was reserved for the spiritually society elite, right? The select few that, that met the standard. So as Jesus is teaching this, he's surrounded by people on the side of a, of a hill who all view themselves, see themselves as outside of God's elite group who are going to be a part of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus begins to teach them. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Dallas Willard translates that phrase, blessed are the spiritual zeros, which I think is a great way to understand it. It says, for theirs is the, the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for you guys are invited. You're invited in. Blessed are, are those who mourn. Blessed who are suffering. Because you're in, you're in. You are invited. Blessed are the meek, the defenseless, because you are invited. And Jesus goes on and on and on. The, the Beatitudes, we should read that as invitations of inclusion. Or to quote uh, James Bryan Smith again, Jesus opens the Sermon on the Mount with this radical teaching that these people, the people surrounding Jesus on that hillside in that day, the ones he describes here, they too are invited. They're a part of this kingdom work and they're invited to the great banquet that Jesus is going to, to usher in in his kingdom. So why is it so important that we start here? Why do we need to begin with, with these words? What does Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 have to do with our own experience and expression of, of eating and gathering as a spiritual discipline, as a means of experiencing and extending grace? It's because we have to start with the understanding that we have been the recipients of, of God's invitation to his tables. We have to see ourselves as, as those who have been invited in order to see our own table, our own home, as a means to offer the same to someone else. When I was a kid, sometimes my parents would throw little birthday parties and, and maybe they would say, okay, we can go to the, the roller rink or you can, go to, um, you can go to the bowling alley or if you were really good that year, if you had done like Chuck E. Cheese. Right? Like, if that, now as a parent, like, that's my definition of, like, eternal punishment. Right? Like, it, <laughs> but it wasn't, the invitation was for me. I got to go do these things. Right? But they would say, you get to invite five friends. 
you get to bring them along to experience this thing that we are doing as well. You get to include them in what's happening. The practice of hospitality is rooted in God's invitation to us through Jesus. Eating and gathering together is both extending and celebrating this invitation in community with the people that God has put around us as a tangible expression of God's greater grand invitation to our family, to, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, sometimes to complete strangers. See, the call to invite, it's, it's rooted, it's established, it's a result of our understanding that we've been invited, that we are included. And so throughout the early church and throughout the pages of Scripture, we see this practiced in, in two primary ways. The first way is practiced is through the opportunity of extending the invitation. Extending the invitation. One way that we practice the discipline of eating and gathering together is intentional time and space set apart to do life with people that God has placed around us who've not yet understood the invitation that Jesus offers them, who've not yet come to a place in their life where they have chosen to also be a follower of Jesus. When I was in high school, my, my best friend lived about half a block away. And, and over the course of those four years, we spent copious amounts of time together. Me going to his house, him going to my house, so much so that it got to the point where it was sort of kind of an open door policy. Like when he got to my house, he didn't really knock and wait for somebody to answer the door. He just came in. And, and I did the same. And usually we went straight through the door, right to the fridge and started feeding ourselves. And we were kind of like family. So much so that he, he would occasionally, you know, like when we were doing something, if my mom was going to correct me, she would correct him as well. And if, if his mom was going to correct him, I would get thrown in there too. And his mom, she was French, and she obviously spoke fluent French. And so sometimes when she was really upset with us, she would start going off in a, in a tyrant of French. And, but I took French in high school. And, uh, and I understood just a little bit of what she was saying. You see, Vince and I, we grew up where I got, to, I got to sample what it was like to be a part of the Barnhart family. I got to be there in, in some of the good moments, some of the bad moments, and, and open door policy. Vince got to sample what it was like to be a part of, of the Moore family. See, hospitality is, is, when we understand that in time spent with people who don't yet know Jesus as their Savior, that's, we're giving them a sample, a taste of what it looks like to be a part of this family of this grand invitation that, that God has given. When, when we have the opportunity to do life with people who are outside of, of a relationship with Jesus, we, we give them a window into what he offers them. And this is something that Jesus, we see throughout the pages of the New Testament all the time, he did as a, as a regular practice. In fact, it's one of the things that drove the religious leaders of his day insane when he would sit down with people that were, were qualified or identified as notorious sinners. In fact, if you turn over to Mark chapter two, this is one of my favorite examples of this. Jesus is in, in this stage of his life, he's calling different people to come and to follow him and he goes to an unlikely person, a man named Levi, who we know as Matthew, who is a tax collector in, in that culture. And he says, hey, I want you to be one of my followers, Jesus. And, and Levi responds. He says, this rabbi has asked me to be a follower of him. Like, this is like a, a beyond a dream, right? This never would have happened. And he responds, and he throws this incredible party, and he gathers all of, of his friends together who are not like the spiritual elite. And this is what unfolds. This is in verse 15. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And when the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus had a very specific purpose for why he was sitting down to dinner with people that, that were viewed as the outcast and unacceptable. We have a tendency to look at, at 
verses like this and, and sort of think like, yeah, like, way to go, Jesus. Like, way to stick it to the man. But that's because we're not, we're not living with a mindset of a first century Jewish man or woman. Like, in our culture, if, if we were to imagine Jesus sitting across the table from a sex offender or uh, a white nationalist, like, I don't, I don't know that we'd be like, yeah, Jesus, stick it to the man. We'd be like, what are you doing? What are you doing, Jesus? So that's, that's what they're feeling in this moment. And that's why the words of Jesus are so instructive to us. He, he spent time eating with and doing life with people who needed healing, who, who, who society and culture viewed, and they understood themselves as dismissed and disqualified in order to communicate grace. In, in order to show them that they're loved and they're valued and that they too are invited into this kingdom work that he's come to do. That they too are a part of, of his kingdom. He says it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners, Jesus says. That word that we translate hospitality in the Greek, it's a, it's a compound word. Um, the first half of the word is the word um, philo, or, or the Greek word for love, for familial love, like uh, Philadelphia, like city of brotherly love. The second word, second half of that word is the Greek word xena, like xenophobia, like fear of the stranger. So it's, it's love for the stranger. It's love for the outsider. This is the literal definition of what the New Testament's talking about when it talks about the practice of hospitality as seeing our homes and our tables as a place where people are meant to belong and to experience this love that Jesus displays so clearly and that we have been the benefactors of, that we have understood is for us. Rosaria Butterfield wrote a book entitled The Gospel Comes with a House Key, where she, she communicates this incredible vision of of the gospel being lived out in community and in our homes in what she calls radical ordinary hospitality. And she describes it this way. She says, radical ordinary hospitality is this. It's using your Christian home in a daily way that seeks to make strangers neighbors and neighbors family of God. That's a, that's a compelling and difficult vision. If you read that book, it is not an easy read. Not in the sense of, of it being weighty, in the sense of what she, what she promotes, what she, this vision that she gives is hard. It's, it's difficult. And yet it's beautiful. And it's compelling. Even think about our logo as a church, Chapel Street Church. Right? We, we see this all the time. We live with it. We talk about it. You've heard me say before that that phrase, Chapel Street, is not because we ever in our history have had a building or a campus on a street named Chapel. It's because we believe that God's call for us as a church is to see each of our homes as a microcosm of, of what he calls us to here. That your home is a chapel on your street. That that's what we are chasing after. That's what we believe. And that cross that you see there at the beginning of the logo, it's, it's got dual purposes. It's, obviously, it's meant to remind us of the cross of Christ, but it's also meant to remind us of an intersection. Of, of that cul-de-sac, that place on your street where your house sits, that you are a, a, a part of it, that that's what it means to be a chapel on a street. What if your home was known as the place that people went when they were facing difficult times? What if they were in need right now? Would they know to stop by my house and say, hey, look, this is what's going on. I don't know if there's anything you can do, but I just thought I'd come and ask. What if they're hurting and, and facing a, a, a challenge? Would they know to go to your house, my house, to, get, to be prayed with, to be loved on, to have somebody journey with them? Would, would they know that? Because that's the vision. That's, that's what we're after as a church, that we wouldn't have three campuses, that we would have 1,000 of them, 2,000 of them, chapels on, on our streets, hospitality being lived out in in very real, tangible ways, this grand invitation being extended in, in each of our neighborhoods, each of our homes, on each of our streets. Thirdly then, and quickly, the second practice that we see of this grand invitation is, is celebrating the invitation. 
Um, I, again, I mentioned I just got back from um, a trip with students to Ecuador. It was an incredible experience together. It's reminded again of just how God uses those experiences in such powerful ways in the hearts and lives of, of the students. And like so often happens when the students come back from their trip, their natural reaction in that moment is, is to get on the phone. They don't, they don't actually ever get on a phone. Let me say that again. Text somebody or send a group message out that says, like, hey, let's all get together. Like, let's all go get ice cream. Let's all go see a movie. Let's all, like, why is that? Why is that the reaction? It's because over the course of those two weeks together, they experienced something that was unique to them as a team that was transformational in their life. And their reaction, their response to that is to say, let's continue to share this. Let's continue to, to experience this together, to do life together. Now imagine when you are a early disciple of Jesus. You've been following him, you've been doing life with him. He, you watched him actually ascend into heaven after he's given you the great commission. And then you're in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit falls on you and, and you've been empowered. You're there for the launch of this crazy thing called the church. Peter stands up and begins to share the gospel with anyone who will listen to it. And, and you have experienced the, the, the transformation of everything that's happened over these last several weeks together. In Acts, 40, or Acts chapter 2, if you turn there, verse 42, it captures the, the disciples' response following all of this. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with, with awe at the wonders, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Verse 46 Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. See, after this incredible arrival of the Holy Spirit on the early church, their reaction, their, their, the result of that is like, we've got to do life together. We, we've got to be together. We've got to get together to remember and to celebrate, to, to glorify God, share everything that we had together so that, that no one was in need. Acts chapter 2 gives us this incredible description of what it looks like to follow Jesus in community. And, and I, wa I want to be careful here because I, I can see that this could easily be construed, right, as a, the importance of being at church on a Sunday morning or the importance of being in a small group, all of which I am a huge advocate of. I, I believe in the importance of that, and I would tell you that. But I, I, I don't want to dilute this to a programmatic thing. I don't, wanna, I don't want that to be our takeaway. I think what we see here is, is more than a programming issue. The gathering together, the eating together, the sharing in life together, it's not about a program. It's about a shared experience of gospel transformation in our lives. And it's about pursuing Jesus in his kingdom in community. If, if you are a follower of Jesus... It's about gathering with other followers of Jesus and celebrating this grand invitation. As, as, as the book of Hebrews puts it, getting together to um, continue to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Celebrating the invitation because he's changed our life. Because grace has changed us. And we get to live it out in the context of relationships with each other so that, so that, not only we will be reminded of it, but so that the world will know it. So that the people around us will discover it. And that they might understand this very same grace that we ourselves have received from Jesus. So this morning, as each week we've been giving a, a practice or a way to implement this in the course of your everyday lives. I, I want to offer two real quickly to you. First, I, I want you to um, set a date um, I know that this might be difficult to pull off this week. So this week, set the date. Put it on your calendar. Communicate it to somebody so there's some weight behind it. 
to gather people in your home, friends, families, neighbors, coworkers, complete strangers, for the express purpose of creating opportunities for them to experience the gracious and welcoming heart of our God. You don't have to sit down and, and give the four spiritual laws. You don't have to <laughs> preach. You just have to welcome them into your home and, and with the intended purpose that they feel loved there. With the intended purpose of pointing them to a greater love. And then, and or, and or, gather together this week with fellow followers of Jesus and around a meal. This could be your small group. This could be your nuclear family. This could be any group of followers of Jesus. Gather together for a meal just to celebrate the goodness of our God. Just to celebrate his grace in our lives. Ask yourselves this question. Where are you seeing God's grace and goodness most clearly in your life right now? And celebrate. Have a party because of God's grand invitation. Remember it so that we continue as the church to extend it. See, this morning as we conclude, we have the opportunity to, um, to come to the Lord's table. See, when N.T. Wright said when Jesus was teaching his disciples about the significance of his life and his death, he didn't give them a theory, he gave them a meal. And he's done the same for us. That we can come to his table in order to remember this grand invitation. In just a moment, I'm going to pray for us. The ushers will pass the, the plate. You can take both cups. There's the, the bread in there and, and the wine. Hold on to those. And then um, in a moment, Joe will come up and he will lead us in receiving communion. Um, come to the table. Come to the the grand invitation that you are a part of this kingdom work that he's doing. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship that we have around your table. Lord, that you have invited us in, despite all the ways that, that I'm disqualified, you included me. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity that we have to remember that this morning. As we come to the communion table, remind us of your grace and your grand invitation so that we might reflect it to the world around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.